Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Secretary Austin, and by the way, both, for both of you, thank you for your service to the country. I, we really do appreciate it. I do. I know I do. The folks back home do. Uh, Secretary Austin, I wanted to um, ask you a couple of questions, um, sort of along the lines of, of what uh, Senator Tuberville asked. You mentioned earlier that you didn't want to spend a lot of time and you thought that it was a drag on our, on our force and spending money on things that don't make us a fighting force. You just mentioned that you don't get the time back. With the, uh, the stand-down day to address extremism, that cost the military and taxpayers nearly 5.4 million man-hours. And as we talk about recruitment, I think it is completely naive to, to, when we talk about the numbers, to separate the challenges that we have now from the, the, the politics, the divisive politics that have been injected now into the military. The military stands as this great meritocracy where people can achieve great things, but by infusing divisive DEI trainings, by infusing abortion politics, by infusing COVID vaccine mandates, it has created division in the ranks, and we have heard from those military members. And I sent you a letter last week, and I wanna ask you, we talked about in the letter reference the $86.5 million for dedicated diversity and inclusion activities. I want to ask you here today, how many DEI-related positions exist in the Department of Defense? I can't speak to that specific number. I'll take that question for the record with your permission, uh, Senator. Sure. Um, and, and in terms of that number, uh, I. It's a small percentage of uh, an $842 billion budget. Um, and, and I would just further point out with respect to DEI, I, I think you know, Senator, that uh, Congress requires that we have a DEI program. Uh, in the 2020 NDA, uh, it, we, this, it states, the Secretary of Defense shall design and implement a five-year strategic plan for diversity and inclusion in a Department of Defense. Yeah, I don't, but I don't know what act these activities are, which is the purpose of the letter. I don't know what materials are being submitted. We looked, so hopefully the, the response to the letter will be, in fact be responsive to what actually is being pushed uh, with these so-called trainings. And then I do want to ask you, so there were nearly 17,000, well, there are over 8,000 military men and women who lost their jobs because of the COVID vaccine mandate. Is that correct? Uh, that's, that's, that's about right. Okay, so uh, we talk about recruitment challenges. Are you actively going after to try to get those 8,000 people back? They, they, have a, uh, they have the ability to uh, reapply. Well, right, no, I'm asking what are your efforts? They have the ability to reapply for, for uh, readmission. Are you recruiting or, these folks? Are I you, am not recruiting, but they have the ability. So Sayonara, 8,000 well-trained folks. We, we are recruiting new recruits. Okay, yeah. and so what happens now to the remaining several thousand who uh, didn't get the vaccine, are you intending to fire them as well? There are several folks that weren't immediately dismissed who refused the vaccine. They're still in the military. Are you planning to fire those folks as well? The vaccine mandate, Senator, has been rescinded. So you don't, you, now even though they were refusing when you did have the policy? That's right. The so your commitment here today is those folks are not gonna lose their jobs? Not for a vaccine mandate, Senator. Okay. Well, I would submit me, that. If, with, if I with, could, I'd like to go back to sure. the five million hours that you mentioned, and I'd like to ask the chairman who submitted that number where that number came from. We'd be happy to back it up. If you take a, the stand-down day by the number of folks that didn't work that day, that's where we get the numbers. So we'd be happy to follow up specifically. I do have a question. Um, that's, not, that's, that's not accurate, Senator. Okay. Well, how, maybe you can answer. How many man hours were sacrificed that day? You just testified you can't get those hours back. How many hours were sacrificed on the stand down day? Let me ask him to tell you where the numbers came from. Okay. Well, maybe you can get us those numbers when you, sure, res sure. When you respond to the letter it's a, also. It's as simple as this. You know, they, he, when, when asked to provide that number, his, uh, his approach was there are 2.1 million troops. Each, one, each troop spent uh, two hours. And that's where the number comes from. Okay, well, you can't get the time back, right? Whatever that number was, you can't get that time back. Two hours for- General Milley, I do want to ask you a question because I'm, I'm limited on time. I do want to ask you about the Philippines, um, which uh, I think you had mentioned in your previous remarks about uh, that strength, that relationship continues to grow, which I 
personally think is critical in the Indo-Pacific. Can you talk about what some of those efforts, where you think that's headed? I think as we, you know, obviously the, the allies that are talked about the most, Japan, Australia, and India, but I think the Philippines are critical. Could you talk about the strategic value of strengthening that relationship? I can, Senator, uh, but just a point of clarification. Uh, it's 2.1 million, two hours, we factored two hours per person. That's with the 5.4 million. That's out of 2.8 billion man hours available factored on a 10-hour workday five days a week for the U.S. military. So okay, well, whether we're talking about dollars or hours, millions still matter. No, no. The I, folks that I represent think a million is a big number. Sure. Yeah. It, it, I'm just saying what the, where the math came from. Um, and and on, the, on the Philippines, but in broad, more broadly than the Philippines, uh, generally the Western Pacific, uh, it is my view that uh, China is, you heard it in the opening statement, uh, is uh, trying to become the regional hegemon uh, within perhaps 10 or 15 years or so. Uh, and part of that, of course, is putting uh, the, the Philippines and other countries in the region uh, at, uh, at a disadvantage. Those countries want the United States presence there. They, they clearly do. Uh, there's a, really an underreported arms race going on in the Western Pacific right now. These countries are arming themselves up, and they very much, with very few exceptions, want the United States there. That's why the Secretary traveled to the Philippines. That's why we're looking at uh, access basing and oversight. That's why we're looking at a reposturing in the Western Pacific. Uh, it, is a, it is a design there uh, to be forward deployed in order to deter armed conflict with a great power, great power being China in this case, uh, and deter Chinese aggression, uh, not only in the Western Pacific, but perhaps elsewhere. Uh, so these are all linked together, tied together. There's many other initiatives ongoing uh, by the services uh, and also by other countries as well. Uh, but it's really critical, and it's really critical that we get it done right. Uh, and we need to move out with a sense of urgency uh, because the next five years, I think, are going to be determinative uh, of uh, really what comes uh, in the future with our relationship with China. Thank you, General. Thanks for watching, everybody. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, turn on your notifications so every time I put out a video, you can know about it. It'll come up in your feed. Hit that like button if you liked it, and be positive. Peace.